comfortably zoned with the zigzag man in Alameda, California, pushing on the doors of life marked pull and fighting the unholy trinity as we go. Big business, organized religion, and government. I am back, and you are flying high with me, the zigzag man, over the zone from Alameda, California, the northern part of the state, right across the bay from San Francisco, and the sun is shining, and it's it's November, so I can't complain for a number of reasons. Um, first and foremost, I can't complain because I have one of the most interesting guests whoever has appeared on the Comfortably Zoned radio network. Uh, third, maybe fourth time back, you were on Weighted Donuts uh, last time with Wayne Unger, and you are living, not living, but passing through Memphis, Memphis, on the book tour. You're Mark Littell. How are you, sir? Well, I'm doing fine, and... Uh... I'm down here in Memphis, and of course it's uh, it's a lot different than uh, Phoenix or San Francisco or anywhere else because it's humid. <laughs> so, and it's the south. Sa- and it's the south. And, that's right. Uh, it is the south. Yes. Deeper south and, uh, than you're used to. You're used to the kind of border states. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, well, I, I grew up on the Mississippi River, and uh, right down the road from Memphis, or up the road, I should say. About uh, right. 85 miles. So, humidity is uh, uh, something you kind of don't like sometimes because you can cut this with a knife. I mean, truly, you really can. You're a cosmopolitan so. guy. You're you're kind of uh, you could fit in most anywhere. You know that. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, so, I've hunted uh, with the Aborigines, but that was fun. <laughs> all right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you think of the Cubs? Got to start there, huh? World champions uh-huh. last night. But uh, last night was the final game, and they won it. And um, got to love it, huh? Well, they did it in style because it was a little bit against them because they're uh, they're not in their home park, and you know, so they didn't have home field advantage. I mean, I mean, a professional is a professional. He does really matter sometimes where he plays. But, uh, you right. know, they came up with the big runs, and rat-a-tat-tat, the Cubs swung the bat, you know, pretty much. Right. And, and, uh, well, you know, I live in Northern California. Followed. I'm kind of an ace apologist and uh, in the American League these days, among yeah. other teams. I'm a wishy-washy guy. But huh? I look up in the playoffs, and I see names like Donaldson. He wasn't in the World Series, but I see hmm. Coco. Crisp, and I, I see uh, mm. R- Russell, Addison Russell, uh, the shortstop. It's really sad mm. it, yeah. that baseball, uh, that there's an imbalance in the playing field, and that um, I, uh, I hope things get turned around, and I hope in the new player negotiation, the union negotiation, uh, agreement with Major League Baseball that something's done about the luxury tax so that uh, teams don't use their small market or in the A's case uh, they fall into it because of their antiquated stadium that uh, they just don't continue to take money and not put it back into the into the team so yeah. I hope things change from from that standpoint, uh, you're a union member. What do you say about that? Well, you know, it, it's always been that case is, is that there's never been enough back down, pushed to me back down to board the minor league systems at all. And and then, you know, the way they've got it structured is it's uh, you, you, you play there for you, – you get the number one pick, you know, anyway, it, because you're dead last or you're in that rope of dope down at the bottom, the last five or so, and you're sitting there and 
you're strung out in the same situation, twins and everybody else, and uh, they have to, well, we get the first round pick. But, you know, well, you get the first round pick to the big leagues, and all of a sudden he stays there for three years and he goes with the Yankees or Atlanta or uh, San Francisco or, who, or whomever. So or, or a, it is an imbalance. Who to pick, Mark, is based on signability. So exactly. you may not yeah. get to pick the guy you really want because right. you can't sign him anyway. And right. um, so you don't really – it never really balances itself out. Um, and, and plus you're at the mercy of owners who choose not to put the money back in into the team. Vis-a-vis Lou Wolf with the A's right now, you think, mm-hmm. well, you know, they're in this horrible situation with the ballpark. They make mm-hmm. money every year. Okay. Every year. They never yeah. lose money based on the fact that the, the luxury tax pays them like $36 million a year. And if yeah. they don't put that back in the team, um, well. there's no no one standing over them saying that they must. So we'll see what happens with this change. Um Tell me about your book. Tell me, um, as I get off that subject, and I, I want – we both have the same thing. You know, you were telling me off the air, uh, oh. AD something. A, uh, ADD. You told me what yeah. mine was. I wasn't paying attention when they told me what. I was about the same way because I was going to a counselor for a little while, and, you know, and uh, we were talking about focusing, and, and – uh, you know, I I was uh, in in high school. I was just like uh, kind of a little bit all over the map in a sense, and I think everybody else was watching the blackboard, and I was pretty much counting the turns on the fan. And Did they call you a daydreamer. Oh, they called me a lot of things, but yeah, thing. yeah, 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 pretty much. And so, right. you know, I, I was at a counselor, and uh, was I was trying to do some things, uh, and and. He went to a conference and he came back and he said, you know, I've been working, it really, you know, kind of hacked me off a little bit. He said, he, I've been working with this guy for six or seven months and he said, he said, you know, you might have ADD. And I said, what's ad? <laughs> so, and so, and so I said, I can, I can add a little bit, but anyway, attention deficit disorder. And so, you know, the guy, the guy uh, I said, so he explained, he said, well, you might have to go see a, a psychiatrist. I said, am I really screwed up or something here? He said, no, no, no. So so anyway, so I talked to this guy, and he said, uh, he said hey, Mark, I wanted to just ask you a couple questions. And I was in spring training. I was coaching with the Brewers at the time. And uh, I said, well, I really don't want anybody to really find out about this. And he said, well, that's no big deal. But he says, that's, I, that's, that's, that's between you and me. He said, let me ask you a question. Do you drink? Do you, do you use caffeine? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah. He said, well, I, I said, well, what do you do? I said, well, I drink coffee. And I said, how much do you drink a day? I said, oh, a couple pots. And so he started laughing. He said, yeah, yeah, I don't have to ask you anything else. You just come in tomorrow and we'll, you know, on the time that you can and we'll take care of this. So anyway, I had gone through some uh, focusing before to actually that got me into the big leagues through visualization. But, uh, you know, off the beaten path, I didn't really use it that much. Right. And, uh, so, for instance, I couldn't, I didn't know if I could write or anything of that nature. So, once I, once I got, you know, cleared up here and uh, I found that I was, you know, like I told you, I was leader of the pack pretty much. Uh, and then uh, I started reading six to eight, six to eight hours a day. Uh, I was like, I was trying to make up for 46 years of that's a, things that I really wanted to do, and it's not like I'm. It's not like I was stupid because I could. I, I read quite well. I did certain things extremely well. You know, if I wanted to make an A in history, I could. If I wanted to make a A in or a B in biology, I could. Math, you know, whatever. But you know, so uh, I found out that people always ask me. They said, "You need to write a book because you got some really funny stories." And he says, "That's unreal." What you say anyway? Because I'm a little bit different. Kind of a character, I guess. And well, you look at the world through a jaundice kind of, kind <laughs> of an eye that uh, picks up on things that others don't see. Yeah, maybe, and yeah, I'm sure I'm sure I do because, uh, and so I, 
I started writing a couple of years ago, and I actually enjoyed it because it kind of calmed me. And I didn't, I didn't know if I could write, and I said, well, I'm going to write, and I'm going to let somebody read it, and I'm going to let them tell me what they think. And so I wrote four or five chapters, four or five stories, rather, and uh, I passed it around to a few of my friends, and and they and a few of them said, this is really, this is really good, this is funny. And then uh, one of my other friends said he played a couple years of minor league baseball, and he uh, he ran a he ran a big business, and you know, and he said, you know what? He said, uh, nobody makes me laugh, and he said, this stuff does. And I said, well, well, thanks. He said. I said, I really like to back your book. I said, really? He said, yeah. And uh, I had another friend that did a lot of advertising <clears throat> with some big companies as well, and he read, he read my book. And uh, he said, he said, yeah, this is really, this is really something. And I said, you, th- you think so? And he says, I know so. He says, you sound just like Mark Twain. And I said, but you're, but you're telling a baseball story. And uh, yeah, that's, so that's quite a compliment. Uh, yeah, I guess. And. So, I mean, I said, well, he's a crazy SOB, too, out of Missouri, like I am. <laughs> and so, and so anyway, uh, so they, the, the, the two people who edited my book were laughing. They, they, they never, first they called me up and they said, this is pretty interesting stuff you got here. I said, you think so? He says, yeah, both of us have journalism degrees, and they said, it's, it's, in, it's interesting the way you write. And I said, yeah, well. Good or bad, they said, oh, real good. It's different, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And I said, okay. So but anyway, they said, uh, they called me up and they said, well, how many of these stories do you have? And I said, you know, I told them and I'm trying to finish up some other stories here. And so they were into doing this, editing the book and halfway through it, and I kept feeding them stories. And they said, Mark, you can stop. You've got almost three books. <laughs> I said, really? So I got a second book for sure. It's already been edited, actually. But nah. you got to get the first. You got to get the first one out, I guess, and you know, nah. try to. Well, you know what impressed have... me the first time I saw the cover of the book. Oh, uh, this yeah. book right. was huh? the uh, person that wrote that. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. What do they call the the intro? The photo. For... Yeah, yeah, yeah. By, oh, okay. By Whitey Herzog. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Whitey Herzog, um, you know, you fall because you pitched under him, both yeah. with St. Louis and Milwaukee. He, here's you fall under the McGraw line <laughs> heritage. I know. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. You know how it works, right? I'm, I'm, Whitey I, Herzog I, 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 learned everything I'm, he knew from Casey Stengel. Exactly. Who learned right. Everything. He knew from John McGraw. And Whitey Herzog is the Mm -hmm. most underrated executive in modern times. They should be talking about him for the Hall of Fame. I'm going to tell you what. He built the New York Mets, the original New York Mets when they won in 69, would not have been happened without Whitey Herzog in that organization. Right. I, did he tell you stories about that over the years? Did, um, yeah, well, you know, Whitey is in the Hall of Fame, but the thing about it is, I know where you're coming from, he is a little bit beyond that because... Uh, oh, is he, 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 did he make the Hall? Did I miss yeah, that? Yeah, no, he okay. is, yeah. No, he's in the Hall. And so, what, but Whitey, huh? But, 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 but Whitey said... Uh, Matter of fact, in the book and the foreword, nobody's read the foreword because it's not. I have a story in there for people to read, but the, the foreword. He wrote a great foreword, really did. He wrote a super foreword for me, and he and he was talking about Casey Stingle, you know, and about you know, you know, his his way, and that's what I wanted to get out of Whitey when I was helping him with this foreword, and then he and he sent it back. And he said something about me that I didn't know, which really made me. I said, "Well, that's kind of great that he said that." I mean, I mean, he knew me pretty well because, well, well you're with his closer, right? Well, it was. I mean, you're with somebody for almost six years, and you know, you get to know him pretty well. I mean, we went also, we also hunted and fished together quite a bit. So, but uh, um, Whitey Herzog used to live 
when he coached with the Mets, it was probably around 1970, um, he lived in a building across the the way from Shea Stadium, a big brick building with a swimming Ooh. pool. My uncle had an apartment in that building, and yeah. I'd visit him yeah. and hang with Whitey at the swimming pool, and um, what a great guy. You're, you're so lucky to have had him as a mentor. Oh, yeah. No, he's great. He is great. And, you know, why he never had uh, – if he ever had a clubhouse meeting over three minutes, never he never did have a clubhouse meeting over three minutes. Uh, he might have two to three a year, and that was it. And, uh, you know, why he said, hey, uh, let's get together, and everybody said, what's, it, what's, what's Whitey up to? You know, what's Rat up to? <laughs> so – He'd say his piece, and that's about it. And you know, it, but when he said something, you listened. Right. So, so he didn't say. What did he What did he relate to you about Casey? Oh, he was just talking about Casey's. Uh, he said, "I, I, 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 uh, I try you. I try to go with Casey's style, you know, a little bit where he backs off, because Casey was a back off type of guy. It seemed like he'd tell his story, but once he get a re- one or two reporters around him, it seemed like there'd be like five or six, and it'd be seven or eight. Because, you know, the way he told the story and the way he, his tone, his, his tone of voice. And the Stangolese the that he had. Oh, yeah, exactly. And then, exactly. And then, you know, <laughs> why he was talk, talking to me one time, uh, he's got this in the book, in the forward. <clears throat> talking about Casey Stingle's style, and he said, matter of fact, I was, uh, hitting for uh, uh, the Mick, Mickey, Mickey, Mickey Mantle, you know. And he says, I'm hitting for the Mick. Mick. Mick wasn't feeling too good. So I mean, he would been drinking or something, I guess. And so, and uh, I was hitting first. Casey put me in there third. And and uh, in, in, the, in the batting order, which nobody hits third but Mick. So he just decided to throw me in there, you know. And, you know, I barely played and went here and there. And so he kind of grounded out. <laughs> Let me see, the first time, and uh, I popped up the second time, and he said the third time I came up, I had the bases loaded and two outs, and Casey calls time, hey, he says, come here. And, you know, so he, while he's walking, and he's walking, and they meet halfway between third, and Casey says, looks up at him, and he says, tra la la. And he said, and what? He said, what? He said, tra la la. And then he turned around and walked away from Whitey. And so Whitey walked back to the box. And so, and I said, well, what would you do? He said, I don't line up the second baseman hard, you know. And I said, well, tra-la-la. And he said, yeah. So I asked, I asked Casey after the game, I said, what was with the tra-la-la? He says, I just try to get you to relax, you know. And so, you know, it was a subtle moment, you know, just to, but it, it, you don't have to make big deals out of trying to get somebody to relax or, you know, do their thing. So. Right, he's kind of a relaxed guy. Yeah. Did like he have that. stories about the Angels that you you might want to share? Anything that uh, any of his? He almost took him to the top. Well, uh, not in my book, but what he told me, I, th- I, I think uh, Gene Autry's wife got in the way a little bit trying to take him to the top, from what I heard. So. Oh, okay. So yeah. that was what I gathered a little bit because, you know, or strings and all that. Yeah, and then yeah, and then, you know, they thought it could be oh they don't need to do this and this and then the other thing is is like that's like when he was over with you know Ewing Coffin which he's a great guy and but he and Whitey really didn't get along. Because why he wanted to do a little bit more certain things between manager, general manager, and and say hey, we need to get this type of this guy in here and this guy out of here, you know, and a little bit more. You know, right, and, you uh, want to take control more. Right, because you know why, like you said, you know he's 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 brilliant. He is, he's brilliant. You know, I've uh, I've played bridge with him before. He's sharp. He's quick. You know, and right, and he's. And he, he, you know, we, so Mark, you're on this said, book too. First of all, tell me, tell me the name of the book and where it can be uh, purchased. Yeah. 
That's uh, on on the eighth day God made baseball. On the eighth day God made baseball. What a wonderful you, title. <laughs> thank you. That really, and, that's very cool. Yeah, um, then, uh, if you can you can get it on Amazon and we're coming out with a soft cover. It's it's up now, so you can get it and it should be a November fifteenth, you know, uh, due date for a ship for shipping, getting it out to the people. Beautiful. And who, who illustrated the cover? It's got this beautiful um, illustration of a big hand holding a baseball. Uh, that, well, that's uh, my hand, and uh, that's my hand in there. And then I got I found a ripped up baseball, and I wanted me holding that that baseball. And then we put the world inside the baseball, and uh, so that's my hand in that picture. And then it's wrapped around, you know, the way it, it's laid out. And she did a really nice job. And it's Shelly Brazil. But she used to work for the Yankees and also the Chargers. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. And But she lives in Colorado, but she was in, she, she was in, she illustrated, you know, like what she did right there with, with the book. And, so I, I knew that I wanted the hand in the baseball and because, you know, I, I actually wanted it more coming out of the earth because, you know, I'm a farm, a country boy, you know, so. Right, you are. But, you know, but with the, the Mark Latell down at the bottom, you know, because, you know, I wrote the book. It was edited by people that, you know, I, you know, I wrote the thing. And it's, that's the one thing I guess not many ball players do. They don't write books. Or, there's the co-author, but not oh, yeah. right. So, so, so it's uh, it was you know my layout, and then we had there's seven, there's 17 chapters and in it, and 254 pages basically, and four, 42,000 words in this one. The next one's a little bit longer actually. Wow. And uh, but the it's, and but the funny thing is that uh, I. Uh, she, you know, she pulled it together, and, and uh, Kelly Coppola, who edited it for me, and John Paul Thoreau. <laughs> what a great name, John Paul Thoreau. And, uh, and so uh, they did a really superb job. It's, and then I had to come back in, and they made me stay in tune. I said, no, 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 this, is, this isn't the way. I said, this isn't the way a southern twang should say it. I said, it's got to be right here, just like kind of like I said it, but if you want to edit it, it's got to be edited like this, so. You know, don't, you can take away the run-on sentence, but, you know, just, you know. But you can't take the part. tone out of your voice, you know. Yeah, and they, you know, yeah, they agreed. They, they all, that's the first thing they always said. They, they said, we don't want to take the tone away because the tone's, it, it's good, you know. I said, good, okay. That was a good agreement. I mean. Nice, nice. So, but, um, uh, you know, it starts at age six, my first at bat, and I never had been to a ballpark. My father got shot in Korea, really uh, tore up. And uh, he was in a cemetery one day. They just pinned down, I guess. He and his, you know, there's like seven or eight of them up there. And he was trying to get them out of there. And I didn't know it. I didn't know this was almost three months ago. And I kind of broke down over it because I didn't know. But I read the chaplain's report. And my dad, you know, was actually acting as a decoy. And when he motioned with his right hand, he was left-handed. But he motioned with his right hand. He got shot in his right arm because it, it came out from behind that uh, uh, cemetery stone. And right. so, and he said he was getting peppered. He never talked about that ever. My mother, he, I would hear him at night just yelling and screaming, you know. And that's you know the, you know. And so, but uh, and and they made it down the hill and so he eventually tried to make it down the hill and he got hit by some shrapnel and so they thought he would had bought it actually and uh you know he's a marine and my mom had been carrying me for three months at the time and she was back in the states obviously and uh she was a registered nurse and uh so a black guy and an indian went back and you know you know drug drug him back out of no man's land and and got him back you know, into a, uh, you know, just a, like a mass guess, shooting help. And, they, and they, they put him on the, you know, the ship, the uh, uh, Hope, the white, that, that white ship that they had for medical personnel. And, right. 
You know, so the one doctor said, let's, amp- let's amputate the arm. The other doctor said, no. I said, I think I can save this arm. But he says, you know, so he wore a brace all of his life on his right arm. But he, he tried to play catch with me the very first time when I was a little boy, like five, you know, when we start throwing a little bit. And I threw three or four or five pitches to him. And he said to my mom, he said, Jeannie, he says, I, I can't do this because – he put the glove over his brace a little bit, and it just dinged it, you know, and then just like a, you know, nerve and vibrations and things. And so my dad only played catch with me once. And then my brother, uh, Eric, uh, he he ended up catching me. He was a year and 16 days behind me, and he played. He caught for Mississippi State, and he got drafted out of high school like I did, but he didn't sign. He went to Mississippi State, and he got drafted out of college, and. Uh, and he uh, he didn't want to sign here. He he didn't want to play <laughs> professionally. So anyway, Greg, but, uh, just so you Eric, Eric caught me. Air, you talked a little bit about him to me off the air. What yeah. what were the particulars that he didn't? Uh, he said he wanted to stay back on the farm, or um, oh no no no. Eric had an education. He wanted to get married to Susan. And I'll tell you right oh, up. Okay. The funny thing. I'll tell you right, the funny thing in the book, what it says is I called Eric because the scout, I was uh, I was in the big leagues. I was young when I went to big leagues. And so uh, scout came, one of the scouts came by and was up there for the, uh, you know, in the war room, you know, during the uh, June draft. And he said, hey, your little brother got drafted again today. And I said, oh, really? I said, well, I'll call him tomorrow. So I called him up, and, you know, he was at, he was at the house, mom and dad, and I said, hey, I said, uh, I heard you got drafted, and Eric's pretty funny. He's pretty dry. And he said, yeah. And I said, are you going to sign? And he said, and he paused. And I said, he said, let me tell you something. That's a bunch of shit what you do. <laughs> and so I started laughing, you know. So he was, he knew. He, 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 he said, I'm double A tops, and you know it. He said, I'm going to marry Susan, and that's where I am right now. I'm in Memphis with him. <laughs> So, so he was a, he could have been a great scout because he was able to I guess, scout yeah. himself. Yeah. Oh yeah. Could, That's a good point. Could have yeah. saved himself a lot of trouble and heartache by do by knowing that you know, knowing right. what he, what he top out at. Yeah. When did you know that you were going to be a big leaguer? That you, that you had well, the skills for? Well, well, professional. Rather, I thought at some point I'm going to be a professional, but big leaguer. Yeah, but I but I mean, even if it came to you after you were a professional, when did you know that you were going to make it all the way up? Well, that kind of goes with my very very first story because when I was six, because I never seen you know, I never I never been on a baseball field when I took my first at bat, and I went up left handed because I had a big old bat that my dad had used, and we were live out in the middle of nowhere, and my mom said. Here, if you want to hit, if you want to hit a little bit, he said, just you know, take this bat and hit rocks across the road, you know. So, I, you know, I'm, I was, it just turned fungo, sick. fungo style. Yeah, I guess, yeah, and yeah, exactly. And so, and I was swinging it left-handed. I'm a right-handed thrower, but I'm a left-handed hitter. But so I just swung and swung and swung and swung and hit, you know, to where I could hit a rock, you know, and uh, with this bat. So. I went up there. My dad took me to my first ball game ever to see a baseball field, and it was in Gideon, Missouri, and where I grew up. But but we were, we were living in Ward L at the time, and he knew the he knew the sheriff, who must have weighed about 450. His name was Bo Wingo, and he had a Stetson hat on. He had the the glasses on at nighttime, and he was smoking a cigarette on the bench, and he was managing the team <laughs> of little leaguers. <laughs> it's funny. Oh wow! <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, and Dad peeked around the corner, and he said, hey, Bo, he said, you know what you're doing? And he says, hey, Alan, how you doing? He says, come on around the other side. So he said, he says, Bo, this is my son, Mark. And he said, he said, you know what, Bo? He said, I know it's late in the season, but my son would love to get a drink when he can get at bat. He said, I know we're not registered or anything, and it was the end of the season. And Bo looked at me, and I said, here's this big guy looking at me, and I'm six years old, and I didn't. I never seen a baseball field ever. That was the first time ever. <laughs> and so, and Bo said, "said Mark, you want to hit?" And I said, "I." And I paused, and I said, and then the Marine, yes sir, came out, and I said, "Yes sir." And so, 
And so he said, well, you stay right there. I want to talk to this other guy on the other side. So he did. He, he said, you go over on that other side and you'll hit over there. And so uh, to make a long story short, I went up left-handed and I had, you know, and there's this guy named Pedro and there, there was this uh, guy in the dugouts, you know. He, he, they, they were they were two years older than me. These, these kids, they were eight, and they said, uh, and the one, the one kid in our dugout said, "Pedro's going to carve you up." And so, and I said, and I said, and I, I said, I didn't know what that meant. And I said, at age fourteen, I would soon find out that's called talking shit. And so, right. and, so, <laughs> so I walked up story. to. I walked up playing up. Up to, Yeah, I would carve you up. <laughs> I didn't know. And he said, well, you need a helmet. And I said, oh, okay. So we got in the helmet. And, you know, everybody had, you know, they had a hel- you know a bag full of bats and helmets and a first baseman's in the catcher's mitt and the catcher's gear. And that was about it. And, you know, somebody had lice. Everybody had lice. So, hey, I have know. a question. Did they ever try yeah. to turn your batting around when you, when you got to be a pro because – you bat left, and you turn yeah, right. Know. His arms exposed. Your shoulders exposed. Yeah, your, your arms exposed. Did they talk to you about that, or did? Um, nah, no, they didn't, they didn't talk to you about that so much. Uh, okay. Uh, Just. I mean, I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew the deal. But here's the deal, too. You got to think. You know, if I'm pitching and I'm throwing 93, 95, and you know, I'm not going to hit the pitcher, and he sure the hell ain't going to hit me. You know. Yeah, it's true. So, too. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm up to there. Be a, a union, you know. and why would they want to to hit? I mean, unless it was. Well, there's uh, no. You know, unless, unless I'm. And, yeah, unless the catcher, uh, unless I drill the catcher for some stupid reason, the catcher was up at the plate. You said better hang loose or something like that. But, or you know, this, how often you know. you're a pitcher? How often does a pitch get a, just get away from you? That could happen. Oh, well, back then, you know. At least that's what you tell the umpire when you, when you head hunt. Well, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I, you know, Whitey knew that I would do it, and so did a lot of other people. And, you know, when we were playing the Yankees, Billy Staple, he was the clubhouse guy at the time. He was 14 years old, and he was telling me a story. And he said, the first time I walked in, because Billy's got some books out there right now, and so Billy said, uh, uh, first time I saw Mark Littell walk in, he was just telling me this two months ago. He said, the team's walking in, and Mark Littell walks in with the team, you know, dressed nice, you know, in the suit and everything. You know, I said, gee, this guy, this guy's an all-American guy right here. You know, you can, you can tell, all-American guy. And all of a sudden, he opens his mouth. <laughs> so, and then... <laughs> You know, the funny thing is, I always tried to act a little goofy anyway, because, you know, I, didn't, I really didn't want anybody knowing my personality, because, the, you know, Bob Gibson always said he'd never talk to an opposing hitter, and I never did either, uh, except one time toward the end of my career. But, you know, I didn't want to know anybody know my personality. And so the clubhouse, the little 14-year-old clubhouse guy, he, you know, he's, they're, they're like gophers, they're like two or three of those guys, you know. And so in the visiting clubhouse. But the commissary where they had to go get stuff, is over on the on on the home side. So when he was at, in, you know, working for the Yankees, he'd be you know you know trudging through the Yankee clubhouse, you know, going to get you know chew or you know a certain candy bar or whatever, you know. Right. And the play the players would sometimes ask. He said, Billy said, he says one time that the players asked ask him when he, and he was 14 years old. He said, Hey, that Latell guy over there is he really nuts? As they say he is. Do you think he'd drill you? He said, yeah, he's pretty nuts. He's a pretty screwed up guy. He said, I think he would. <laughs> it's a 14 year old kid saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. What, what an experience for him to be 14 and, and oh. be in a Yankee clubhouse and, yeah. and all that. Um, his, gra- his grandfather near the clubhouse attended and, and he needed a little help, you know, and he said, hey, you want you want to help out? And he said, yeah. He said, yeah. He said, well, just keep your mouth shut, and if somebody wants something, you go get it. And if we ain't got it, got it. You got to go to the other side and get it and bring it back over. So, oh, wow. Well, I remember those years being 14 and how cool that would have been to have that oh, opportunity. Yeah. 
as a kid. Oh, yeah. Tell me about, um, you mentioned Bob Gibson, and he's yeah. kind of an enigma to uh, yeah. the average yeah. baseball fan. He yeah. coached a, a long time after after playing. He coached with the Mets, Atlanta, if I remember. Um, right. And, you know, it was he grew up in a town that, a Midwestern town, Des Moines, was it, or... Omaha. Omaha, okay. Yeah, because he, he played at Creighton basketball, and he was a Harlem Globetrotter. Right. And uh, so you, my feeling is the best athletes are basketball players. Uh, yeah. They, yeah. Yeah, right, am I right? I mean, yeah, I, mean, um, I played basketball, and I could have played uh, college basketball. and But I, I wanted to play basketball just to keep me in shape and – you know, hand-eye coordination and my feet and everything. For All those things, just your hips moving yeah. around, the reaction yeah. time. Um, so that alone, plus he had this look on his face. Oh, yeah, right. I mean, yeah. I see pictures uh, um, of him glaring down off that mouth. He's a big guy, right. too. Um, yeah. But what yeah. Would, now, that was... That was what I call the um, the exterior. Give me mm-hmm. some insight as to his interior. What was he like as a human? Well, you know, everybody, he's tough, you know. He's tough, you know, and he, he stayed that way. And he, and he was there, he, he was a highly competitive, and he was just there to beat you anyway, any way he could. I mean, I saw a picture of him last week, and it, I don't, you know, pay too much attention, but, you know, I saw a picture of Bob Gibson taking a shot at Creighton University in a basketball, and, and I said, hey, there's a lean, mean fighting machine, you know, right there. So he, this ki- this guy, this kid, this person, this professional had an incredible amount of grit, and, you know, he was coming through the 60s when it was an interesting era, you know, of civil rights. And right, that's what I was talking so, about, where he yeah. was raised in the Midwest. Yeah, because it's like, it's like Ali. Mid- yeah. yeah. It's like it's like Ali in Louisville, see? And it's the same thing, Ralph. You know, uh, those two in particular, because I knew I know Ali's son, Ahmed. And Ahmed is coaching in uh, Western Iowa at a junior college right now. And he, he was a baseball player at Louisville as a catcher. Yeah. And I met him three years ago at coaching in the Arizona <clears throat> Collegiate League. And you can relate Ali and Gibson as two of the same, in a sense. And <clears throat> uh, uh, i, I got to tell you this story. I mean, I'll get back on Gibson, but Ahmed – wanted to actually meet me because I was the nutty buddy guy. <laughs> I said, okay. Right. So, and so I said, I said, what did you say your name was again? He says, I'm Ed. And he had a great big smile, and he looked like a catcher the whole part and everything. And I said, okay. So I got to know him a little bit. And I said, okay, give me a – and, you know, we're coaching in Phoenix, and that's where Ali, you know, was. And I said, give me, give me, a, give me a Muhammad Ali story. Give me, a, give me a father story. You got one for me? And he said, yeah, I got one for you. I was nine years old. My dad had not, you know, gone into, you know, any sickness at, at that point, you know, with the Parkinson's. And I said, okay. And he said, yeah, I'm walking around the house, and I have Nintendo. It wasn't Xbox. It was Nintendo back in the first one. And so, right. that, you know, my dad said, hey, I don't want you playing that anymore today. You understand me? He said, oh, yes, yes, sir, you know. And he says, so I put it down. And he said, well, he walked away, and about an hour later, I start playing again. I'm walking around. And he said, I feel this hand go on my shoulder. And he said, and and I looked up, and then I felt his hands were so big. He said, his hand covered both cheeks of my ass when he hit me. <laughs> so it, I said, <laughs> And he said, he got both kicks my ass. And I said, and I said, what, what happened? He said, hey, yeah, I want to hit. And he said, what happened? And he said, well, I felt like I was going to hit the wall. And so 
<clears throat> I said, well, what happened after that? He said, I never played Nintendo ever again. <laughs> For any reason. <laughs> For any reason. I thought it was funny. Yes. It was great. <laughs> I mean, that would convince you. Don't, you don't hear those stories every day, you know? Uh, so he he didn't get into boxing. He got into baseball. Yeah. Well, he wasn't the boxing type. He, he was probably 5'10", and, and, but he was stocky. He was built like a brick. You know, but he was a really good kid. You could tell he's a really nice kid. He's fun to be around and everything. And, and, uh, that's very, so we, very cool. You know, I was, I was trying to help him with the baseball because one of the parents was getting some crap one day and I went over and he was at a college game. And so I wanted, I, I reached around him and hugged him and I wanted the parents to, to see because I, I got a little tenure. And so, I said, hey, you're doing just fine. I said, screw those people. screw those guys, you know. I said, just stay after it. <laughs> you know, so, anyway, it's funny. But, nice. So, yeah. Mark, like, every now, you're such a funny, relaxed guy, but every now, now and again when we talk, the competition, yeah. like you were mentioning, Gibson's intensity and – is uh, Mark crazy? Would he throw one at me and this and that? Right. How do you, when you retire, handle that lack of competition, of mm. being able to put a game face on, being able to, well, yeah. I mean, it could be marbles or, or you know, um, whatever the game is, it could be, you mentioned bridge. I played with him. Bridge is a very competitive game. I know oh, yeah. folks who right. play bridge. They don't play for fun. No. They talk about bridge, it's like going into war. <laughs> you got to have the right partner. you got to have, you know, this, that, and the other thing. You know when to bid, right. you know, all that stuff. How do you, oh. when you retire, I know just coaching, you went into coaching, it is, Living through somebody else doing it sometimes isn't enough, I'm guessing. How do you handle that, or did you handle that? Well, the thing, I think, the thing about coaching is I, uh, the guy who signed me was Gary Blaylock, and when I went into coaching, and uh, Gary, Gary was the pitching coach for the 85 Kansas City Royals World Series team. And was, he a he Yankee, might, was he a Yankee farm? Yeah, he, yeah. Yeah, and he was. I and remember was, him when I was a kid. Gary Blaylock he, was uh, nope. coming up. I think he won a watch in spring training for the best. Are you really? Oh, and he's he got or John he, Gabler. He or John Gabler. Now, um, we're going back sixty years. So um, sure. Oh yeah. Excuse hey, me. Well, Gary's still alive. He's eighty-five, and Whitey's eight, almost eighty-five. And wow. Uh, but uh, I was talking to Gary last week because he's coming to my thing in Missouri for the sports hall of fame thing. But the thing about it is on the competition is the, the competition part and the coaching part is, you know, you're trying to, one, Gary told me, he says, I think you're making a hell of a coach. I said, thanks, you know. So, but he said, he said, you know, here's, I said, okay, so what, 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 what should I do? You know, I'm, I'm gathering his thoughts. And he said, well, here, first of all, he said, just, you know, kind of lay back and get a lay of the land. And he said, don't just jump out there and, you know, start saying this and that and this and that. He said, you're going to say what you need to say anyway. But he said, you know, don't try to overdo it. And don't. And he said, you know, always always tell the truth. If you don't know it, tell them you're going to, you'll find the answer out. They'll love that part when you say that. And, the other, and, you know, and then the other thing is it's going to take you five years to, you know, to get a plan down. And he was right. <clears throat> so, you know, even if you're a big leaguer, that doesn't make you a good coach. You gotta really want to be a coach. You what you got you have you wanna teach. You have to teach. No, I shouldn't say coach. I say teach. As a matter of fact I have all my kids, they all call me Mark. They don't call me a coach. I have thirteen year olds, fifteen year olds, eighteen year olds, twenty two year olds, they all call me Mark. Let's cut to the chase, you know, and let's let's play baseball. You don't have to I said, I, I, I'm giving you free reign to call me Mark instead of Coach Littell. So, you know, right. so let, let's, let's get through that. So did you coach in the big leagues with the Brewers? When I knew you like 30 years ago, you were oh. at Stockton. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. 
Um, I was, uh, I, I, I was, I was with Boats. Were you roving at that time? Uh, I, I didn't row for the Brewers. I rowed for the Royals. And, um, uh, I'd done rookie ball, A ball, double A, triple A. Double A was... Were you managing at Stockton or were you coaching? Well, they asked me to, but I didn't want to. You know, yeah, but, uh, I, I had Lamar Johnson and Tim Ireland and, right. and, uh, you know, White can't Johnson. remember. Lamar told me that Dick Allen could hit a baseball harder than anybody of his day. Well, I don't doubt that one bit. You know, he used like a and that's 42 what I remember out. talking to Lamar, Lamar Johnson yeah. about. And, yeah, 42 um, hours back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was a great organization. You, um, just your rovers, guys like, um, uh, oh, Ag- Agli, Agli, I can't pronounce his name. Well, Ogilvy? Ogilvy, yes. Yeah, Rove, Benji. Um, Ogilvy. Uh, yeah, Ogilvy. Romero was catching. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Was it Tim Ireland, Tim Ireland is character. Tim Ireland is uh, exceptionally smart, and he he gets in trouble just, I don't know why, <laughs> Fred Stanley, Fred Stanley was the farm director, and I was going, I was the pitching coach, and it was just me and Timmy in, in Stockton, and I don't know if they thought we were going to win the league or not win the league, it didn't matter if we won the league, but, you know, just, okay, try to hold it together, but the day before, uh, we broke we broke for Stockton in spring training, I was walking by the office, and Fred said, hey, country, come here, yes, come here. Country, I tell you something. I said, okay. Just shut the door. I said, you yeah, know, wait. And he said, hey, you can't get kicked out of any ball games this year. And I said, yeah, I already figured that out. And he said, he <laughs> says, Coach, because Tim's going to be kicked out next. Oh yeah, because Timmy's going to get kicked out of four or five, and he's probably going to get a suspension. You know, and I said somewhere. And I said, yeah, I figured that out. Well, he did. He got a ten game suspension, and that was a that was an unbelievable show that he put on. I mean, holy cow. I mean, he took the umpire's hat off, filled it full of chalk. I first said, country, I'm going to kick you off. You don't get my hat back. And then and his hat's flying over my head, full of chalk and a swirl. And then I said, there's your hat. I go after Timmy. Timmy, Timmy kicks balls. He's got his hand on his hips. I'm still running after him. He picks the ball, throws it at the umpire, and he jumps out and goes out through the stands. Instead of going out the, the right way, he goes out through the stands and he gets a standing ovation. And he does it. This, this he does this crap with the brass in town. Every time the brass is in town, he he, oh. he is his, he he <laughs> definitely wants to put on a show. Like, go ahead and fire me. You know I'm really good and I'm really smart. And I know what the hell I'm doing. Well, it was just right. me and Timmy there. You don't want to fire me. You don't want to he fire him. reminded me like Wally Backman with, with Oh uh, yeah. Well he's smarter than Backman actually. But, but I mean I mean Timmy's yeah, he speaks like two or three different damn languages in Japanese and everything else and and really? uh, but yeah, and, and Timmy Timmy would uh is is uh he would uh he would just we we ended up winning the the league that year, which was even funnier because everybody thought the double A team were was going to win, and they got knocked out in the second round. And then, and then we're out there on the limb out in Stockton, and we ended up we weren't supposed to beat that team in Visalia because they had like well, they, had, they had a powerhouse team and pitching. But you know, think, is that the year that they that they had Puckett? No, it was uh, after that, but uh, that was Marty okay. Cazoba. And that year, Marty yes. Cordova, and big guy. they had two, big. yeah, they had two or three guys that could hit, and they had a couple, couple big pitchers. But you know, my my pitching staff did Hawking a great job. Might have been the, Hawking who? might have been the shortstop. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Jeez, that those so, were great days. But the but, you know, but it, Timmy and I ended up winning the damn league, and we we were the only well, the team that won in the organization that year. I thought that's funny because it's just me and yeah. him and a trainer. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How much batting practice do you want? I, I, I threw batting practice nude one time, you know, out there behind the um, stock. Well, you had, had, your, cage you had there. your nutty thing on. Um, well, no, I had, a, I had an L screen behind me, so I didn't sneak out there too far. So. <laughs> okay. Well, that. <laughs> sometimes these interviews, 
It's more than we need, Jimmy. Uh, Mark. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, well, when you come back, you bring Gary Blaylock next time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> would that be great for you? It would be great for me because I grew up in New York, and spring training, I would follow the Yankees. In, the Giants had already left, if I'm not mistaken, or mm. about to. This was 57. And oh, wow. I, I can remember any news from spring training. You live in New York in February, March. It's mm-hmm. freaking cold. Let me tell you, colder than a witch. And yep. you And you see on the weekends, maybe you, you'll see a Fort Lauderdale on television with the Yankees playing. And the boat's mm-hmm. going by in the back. And you yeah. Go, oh my God, this is baseball's heaven. Spring training's <laughs> heaven. And we no. follow these guys. I'd like to talk to him about uh, those days. Um, I, it might have been Langfield uh, before Fort Lauderdale when Gary Blaylock right. was there. And the, ne- the time after that, bring Whitey Herzog. We'll talk to him about the swimming pool we used to sit around in when he was the coach <laughs> of the Mets. Well, he's funny. He's got some really good stories. Also, Gary has some great stories, you know, because – you know, a lot of times those guys played winter ball, and I like hearing those, you know, Venezuelan, Dominican uh, stories back then, you know. Oh, I'd, the, lo- uh, I'd love for you to bring him on. But uh, I'll tell you what, sure. you get, you know the numbers, you set it up, you have him call, you tell me 24-7 I'm there for you guys. You got it. All right, Mark. Yeah. And uh, I'm just going to end the show the way I – and every show I do, um, I'm going to say to keep your humor dry, keep your dreams wet, keep your kids out of military recruiting stations, mm-hmm. and keep your kids off the laps of clerics that wear dresses. And you'll be in good shape. <laughs> so all those things, yeah, you, you combine them all. It, it's like you could do two of them, eh, you know, three of them, eh. But you do all four, life's going to be good. Yep. All right. Sounds like a good plan, Ralph. (laughs) You bring Gary or Whitey with you next time. I'll I'll be in touch with them. All right. I will be in touch. Thanks, man. And you're always welcome back. And uh, I hope you, again, we repeat the cover, on the eighth day, God made baseball. That's it. That's right. When did you think of the name of that book? Uh, well, I, <laughs> I'm Orthodox Christian, and I was thinking about, wonder, I wonder what God was doing with baseball on the eighth day one time, and I, I just got to thinking about, you know, on the eighth day, God made baseball. I said, sounds hey, about right. That's very nice. And you didn't spell it yeah. G-A-W-D. You spelled it G-O-D. That's exactly right. <laughs> that's nice. Love you, Mark. Yeah. Come, come back soon. Okay, Ralph, enjoyed the visit. It was great. All right. See you soon. Bye, everybody. Catch you on the flip-flop.